My guest today is Paul Sheriff. How are you, Paul? Hey, I'm doing great, David. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's great to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. It has been a and, while. <laughs> um, I, I already know the answer to this question, but what is your job? What is my job? These days, as little as I can get away with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, as you know, I owned a software company for 27 years and uh, sold it in 2017. And so now I really focus a lot on training, mentoring. Um, I'm actually involved at the local high school down here. Uh, mm -hmm. They have an entrepreneur in innovation center uh, that they put in Franklin, Tennessee. And nice. uh, so I go down, I mentor the kids down there with their projects and it's a lot of fun. So I, I really focus a lot on learning new things myself and then training. Yeah. And you're still self-employed, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Been since 1991. That's a long time. That's, it is. Um, I, I'm not. I, I work for the man, as you know. <laughs> and uh, I just uh, I'm wondering, um, what's what was your motivation? Think back to that. Why did you want to be your own boss? You know, I had worked for corporate, big corporate, uh, started out at uh, Boeing many, many mm -hmm. years ago, and then uh, saw how the big guys did it. Then I actually got a job at a very small consulting uh, software company in Germany. So I actually mm -hmm. moved to Munich for about a year. I did not know that. And, uh, yeah, and it was really great. It was a small company, but it, it was growing fast. And I uh, spent a little over a year there. And then uh, I so I said to myself, well, I see how the big guys do it. I see how the little guys do it. I think I can do that. And okay. I think I can take the lessons that I learned from both and apply them. And uh, I also had a, mine was a business computer degree. Uh, so from Long Beach State. So I decided, you know what, I, I think I can do this. And so I really wanted to be my own boss. And uh, the boss that I had in Germany was wonderful and very entrepreneurial. So mm -hmm. I really liked him. I looked up to him. And uh, it was really neat to learn all those skills. So then I just kind of said, you know what? I'm going to jump into this and do it. All right. Well, take me back to that time, 1991. Uh, you were, what, 15 years old? Yeah, that and... right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what did you, you just jump into it? Or was there some prep work to do or what? Well, obviously, there's always preparation you got to do. Um, for me, I got kind of lucky. Uh, a friend of mine was starting a seminar series where we we're going to go around and teach all around the country. In this mm -hmm. days, it was Clipper. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I was a Fox Pro guy, but uh, okay, I yep, yep. So um, I was able to kind of that helped jumpstart it because I was able to make enough money teaching a couple of weeks uh, a month uh -huh. that it kept me that gave me time then on the other couple of weeks to go out find clients and just start building you know, the business that way. In fact, I actually got clients by doing those training seminars. Hmm. So people would come up to me afterward and say, you know, really like what you taught here. I'd like to hire you to help me with this project. Great. So I actually ended up getting a lot of stuff like that. And that was, that was fun. So. Uh, that's and, uh, also going to be a challenge uh, even outside of the train, just finding clients. What's, what was your approach? You know, one of the things that I had started on, somebody had given me some great advice when I first started out. And they said, you know, Paul, if you were to teach and write articles, it'll get your name out there. And by getting your name out there, when you speak in front of somebody and you know this, they think you're an expert, whether you are or not. <laughs> it's the illusion I'm trying to create. It's that illusion. That's right. And by doing that, keeping your name out there, people will find you. Um, you know, that's why staying on social media is very important today, right? LinkedIn, mm -hmm. huge. Um, but you have to be consistent. You have to be posting. You have to be writing, blogging, speaking at local user groups, speaking at national conferences, if you can get them. All of these things are going to help you get those clients, you know? And this is one of the things that I think a lot of, some guys are really wonderful at what they do. I mean, they, they are fantastic programmers, but they don't know how to do that side of the business, right? Sure. Which is the marketing and the sales. And how do you look for that next job when you're so busy working on this job? And that's, that's a juggling act. And Absolutely. you have to prepare by taking some time and, and carve out time. It's, it's all about time management. If you're not good at managing your time, don't go into business. <laughs> sure. I mean, it, it really is that simple because you need to have time to, do the work you need to do to do the billable hours. 
You also have to have a lot of non-billable hours where you're working on getting that next client. So, Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I, I'm, I've never been self-employed, but I was a consultant for a long time working for both large and small companies. And it wasn't uncommon for someone to, to for me to walk into a client and they knew my name just because, like you, I was out speaking and blogging and I have this show that has literally tens of viewers uh, across the world. So uh, um, yeah. it, it did help. Um, it does. It does. And that's something I think that a lot of people don't think about. And uh, I think that's really crucial. It really helped jumpstart my career. And then, you know, slowly over time, you can build up and build your business. So, yeah, that, that was one of the things I think that kept me from ever going independent was the time not only to market myself beyond just showing up and speaking, uh, but also the time for all of the overhead, the administration, the billing, the the collections, oh. the um, oh uh, hiring. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, talk a little bit about that. There's 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 more to yeah. this than just being a good software developer. Well, exactly. And it kind of goes back to that time management I talked about, but also about you have to understand a little bit about business as well. Like you said, accounting, you know, you uh, get a good accountant. Um, you know, you may need some legal advice. And how do you how are you going to form your company? Is it going to be sole proprietor? Is it going to be an S corporation? Is it going to be a C corporation? Um, for that, you'll probably need to hire a lawyer. Um, yeah. You need it. To me, it's all sitting down and making a plan. And people, you know, you, but if you uh, fail to plan, you plan to fail. Okay. <laughs> and really that is a, it's a truism. And mm -hmm. if you focus on the business part as well as, you know, the programming part, because we love to program, it's, that's what we enjoy doing. But you still have to think about all those other aspects, the marketing, the sales, the accounting, the legal, all of those things, you have to at least understand a little bit about it. And yes, taking that first step and jumping out there is tough. As you said, it was hard for you to find the time to do it. So I think, and I've told this to a lot of people, I said, the best time to start a business is when you're single <laughs> uh, and you, were, you don't you have kids. Life. Right, right. If you are, if you have a simple life and you don't have, you know, a significant other and kids and everything else, that's the best time to start a business. Now, if it doesn't mean that you can't when you're married, that's fine but you need to have complete buy-in from your partner, right? You need to talk to them and you need to say, look, I'd like to do this. And then you have to think about that money management too. Do you have six months of living expenses in the bank? Because it's going to take you that long to really get going and really make that profit that first time, unless you get lucky like I did. And I mm -hmm. fell into this training seminar series. And back then we made a lot of money doing that. So that helped. But it also helped. I lived in a small little apartment and I had nothing. So I worked 60 to 80 hours a week. Yeah. So uh, this is not time you're taking away from your significant other. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And that's the other thing, going back to time management. If you are starting a business, if you do have a wife and kids, okay, or a husband and kids, whatever it is, you need to carve out that time that says, these are my work hours and these are my at-home hours. You have to make that commitment. And every now and then you're going to have to work a little bit more, but then try to make it up somewhere else on the home front. Good life advice. <laughs> it is. You, it you is. mentioned the types of business. I think you said proprietorship. Uh, there's an S Corp, C Corp, partnership. Uh -huh. which, which one were you? I was an S Corporation. Um, Why is that? When I, so when I first started out, I was just sole proprietor. As soon as I started adding employees, I went into what's called an S Corp, Subchapter C Corporation. It has less tax ramifications than a C Corp. Um, it's still a legal entity where the reason why you want to probably, as soon as you get clients and employees or anything like that, you're probably going to want to incorporate somehow because it does protect you a little bit personally. Okay. Um, let's say you do something wrong and your client tries to sue you for something. All right. So if you keep your personal and your business assets separate, the most they'll be able to do is get your business assets, but not pierce the corporate veil and get after your personal. I so, see. So it's for limited liability purposes. Yes. And that's another thing. There's a limited liability corporation you could do. There's limited liability partnerships that you could do. Um, and 
you know, partnerships, I've never been a big fan of them because I've seen way too many partnerships just go by the wayside and you end up having an enemy um, Mm -hmm. because you disagree or something with your partner. And that can be a little bit of a problem. Um, Now, sometimes it makes sense. If you have one set of skills and your other friend has other sets of skills, like you're the programmer part, he's the business part. Hey, that's a great partnership. And maybe you should take advantage of that. You know. Yeah. So you've never had a partner, but you have had employees. Talk a little bit about that. That's some. That sounds like stress. Uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm actually 30, but you know, you can see the gray hair now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so it's hard bringing on that first employee. You know, when do you do that? Um, you may want to consider bringing in contractors first. Okay, mm-hmm. but there's pros and cons to all of that. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and do just a little shameless plug here, David. But the things we're talking about here are actually on my YouTube channel. I actually have this uh, thing called How to Start and Run a Successful Business. And it's a, it's a course that I have out there. So check I'll out my YouTube to channel. It in the show notes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Because <laughs> um, there's some pros oh, and cons. By the way, I watched, I watched some of that course. It was very good. Oh, great. But, you know, the, the contractors have pros and cons. And I'll kind of go into that in the course there. Um, employees. I ended up at my, in my heyday, I had about 16 employees. Now I'm going to tell you, and I admit this, I'm the worst manager in the world. Okay. (laughs) I just expect people to get their work done, but I recognize that that's my limitation. So what I did is I went out and I hired somebody who became the manager. That 17th employee. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So he was great. I'm actually, he worked with me at Boeing and he actually was, uh, the vice president of Boeing IT direction. He was the IT director. So he knew how to manage uh, large projects, you know, he had hundreds of employees. So it was great. So, and he was with me for 17 years, believe it or not. So, oh, wow. Actually, yeah. Actually, when I sold the business, all of my guys had been there from nine to 17 years. So we had great employees, um, but it is stressful. So if you're not good at that. If you're not good at managing people, I would suggest you hire somebody to help you manage that. That's a good idea. That was, I went, actually went to business school. I have a graduate degree in finance. And uh, one of the case studies that came up over and over again in management classes was the entrepreneur who was awesome at what he did. You know, he was writing software or whatever he was doing, building widgets. And it was really successful. And it became so successful that he grew beyond his ability to manage things because he yeah. wasn't a good manager. He was not a people person. He was a technical person. And of right. course, the answer is that hire somebody to do what they're good at and focus Correct. on what you're good at or, or get sell the company and start over again because you're a, an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's perfectly viable. Absolutely. So, yeah. But it's hard. Uh, you know, because what do you find? A, I, I get this ahead. question a lot. I used to have office hours at local uh, startup incubators. Where do you find employees? Well, you know, back then, um, a lot of it was like on Indeed, but word of mouth um, mm-hmm. to me was huge. Uh, the, my VP that I brought in, Michael, he actually knew a couple of guys that worked at Boeing. And so he recommended them. So I hired them. I hired a couple of friends that uh, stayed friends, still friends to this day. Um, you know, I think LinkedIn is a, is a wonderful resource for that type of thing as well. So uh, there's, there's so many different places, but it's really important that you talk with them. You have in-depth interviews, you, you know, check out their, not only their technical prowess, but will they fit into the group? Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things we did, we always had an office. Uh, My guys could work remote if they had, you know, something going on that day. Hey, I got to stay home for the plumber or whatever. But other than that, we all stayed in the office and we loved being in the office and we loved the camaraderie and having lunch together. And so when I hire people, they always had to come in for the interview. I would not do anything remotely. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's just me, but it really worked out well. One of the things this just came up on LinkedIn the other day, people were talking about, you know, how do you kind of solve problems and how long should you take on a problem? At my company, we had a 10 minute rule. If you don't know the answer to something and you can't find it within 10 minutes, you get your butt up and you go talk to somebody else in the company because somebody has probably done that before. You know, I don't want to waste time. Have my guys sitting there trying to figure something out that's already been figured out. 
And, you know, it's, it does a disservice to the client, too. I feel that we'd be overcharging them. So right. from, from uh, that's I think I've done do. that, but I, I never really put a number on. I like the fact that you've time boxed it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that was a guideline. You know, sometimes somebody could take maybe 15, 20 minutes. No, no, it's an arbitrary and number, fine. but just yeah. having something like that, a rule in place that you can yeah. uh, think about rather than, you know, spend exactly. enough time. That's not great guidance. <laughs> Right. You know, and managing those employees, you got to have standards and you got to have, you know, an employee handbook. There's a lot of things that you have to put in place when you're ready to hire your first employee. Oh, yeah. So that brings up uh, uh, the legal topic. You know, there's a lot of legal aspects of hiring, a lot of those with customers. What's, what are some of the issues that you've encountered? In your well, I mean, almost one of the decades? ones. Yeah. One of the things you got to have a good contract in place for your clients. Now, sometimes you will be you'll have to work on with their client. But that's where having a good lawyer really comes in handy. And, uh, you know, it's an expense, but it's worth it. <laughs> um, and then obviously on the employee side, you got to have that employee handbook. You have to follow all the rules. There'll be posters you have to put up in your break room. Um, you can buy those posters that, that talk about employee rights and all those things. Um, you know, again, having the right insurance in place, you got to have workers comp. You have to, all of that. And then, of course, you're taking on, what, seven and a half percent of their, you know, taxes. So when you're self-employed, you have a basically since there's, you don't have an employer, you're paying 15 percent for your SSDI, all those things like Social Security, things like that, workers comp, all of that. But when you're the employer, you're now picking up everybody else seven and a half percent of that. They only have to pick up half of that 15 percent. Mm, OK, so. So those are things that you have to think about. So yes, there's a lot of legal things in there when you're ready to hire employees. And even when you're taking on clients, you have to have a good contract in place. Um, you said you started in 1991 and you went for 26, 27 years. 27 years, years yeah. There were some really good times economically during that period. And there were some lean times during that period. Oh, there uh, were. How do you balance how do that? <laughs> Well, here again, it kind of goes back. Remember I said, when you're first starting out, you should have six months of living expenses in the bank, right? To tide you over. That number should never get lower, <laughs> okay? You have to have a rainy day fund. And one of the things that I always made sure I did, I had a couple of different bank accounts. So I had the bank account, which I ran the daily business out of. I had then the rainy day bank account. Right. And so it part of my structure of how we build is that when we got the money in, you know, my secretary, she divided it up. Okay. Part of it goes here by a percentage and part went to this rainy day fund. So that way, as times got lean, I had at least something to pull from. The other thing I went to my employees and they said, Hey guys, we have a choice to make. Okay. I can either lay one person off or I'd be, you know, if you'd be willing, I'll cut everybody's salary by this percentage. And by the way, whatever that percentage is, I'm going to cut mine by uh, another 50% more than that. And that way they knew that I was- and They were receptive to that? And they were. They were. The thing is, you got to talk to your employees. When things get tough, talk to them. Don't be in a silo. Don't yeah. think that they're going to understand what's going on. They don't. And the more you talk to them, the more you're going to have loyal employees. And they all appreciated that. And they said, no, we, we everybody here, we like everybody- We'd rather you not do that. Let's all take the pay cut, you know. And then as soon as times turned around, I made sure I pick, put their salaries right back up where they were before. So, I 100% agree with that. I uh, the last year we had layoffs at my company, mm -hmm. and what I which is stressful for everyone. And I always appreciated the fact that my managers didn't they were transparent about it. They didn't try to yeah. sugarcoat it. They didn't try to uh, uh, pretend it wasn't happening, or they didn't try to ignore it. Right. Uh, they, they spoke with us, frankly, they accepted questions. Some of them were hard questions. Um, and it's not, there's no good answers, but the fact that they were yeah. willing to answer questions was good. Yeah, uh, it is. It makes you feel so much better. It makes you feel appreciated and valued yeah. as an employee. And that's so yeah, important. It. So, yeah. Um, but, let's talk. Oh, so you said you sold the company a few years ago. Um, what was that your plan all along? Uh, what's a, a if, if I start a company, do I just stay till I, till it drops or till, till I drop dead or, or, at the I know. Board or do I, or do I have an exit plan of some kind? Yeah. You know, and that's, that's a very individual thing, obviously. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can go. 
when selling. I mean, you could simply retire, just tell all your clients you're not taking anybody new. And then after this date, you're done. Right. And then mm -hmm. assuming you have enough money in the bank to do that, or maybe you're going to go pursue other things. So you could just retire from the business. You could do an employee buyout. Mm -hmm. Right. So you could get, if you have a few good key employees, they pay you over time. Right. So maybe they you carry the paper for 10 years and they pay you out over 10 years or something. Mm -hmm. um, you could do a merger. Right. Find a company in your area that's your competition, maybe even, and go talk to them. So actually, I did that with a couple of different companies in my area. And I talked to them because they, they were friends, even though they were competition, they were still sure. friendly competition. And I talked to them and we tried to make something work. It didn't uh, just because various things, but no big deal. And then finally, I uh, decided to go to a business broker. And so I got this business broker, hired him. And he then his job was to bring me people that are willing, mm -hmm. looking to buy a business. Okay. And it took two years uh, to sell it. So it takes a long time. Interesting. So there's so many different ways that you can do that. H how you do it is kind of depends on what your goals are. You know, for me, after 27 years in business, I still love programming. I love doing all that stuff. I was just a little tired of running the business and having the stress, as you mentioned at the beginning there. Um, so I decided, you know, I think it's time for me to move on. And I found, I mean, and the reason it took me two years to sell the company, because I was not going to leave my employees in the lurch. I didn't want mm -hmm. them to go with some people that were going to run it into the ground. And trust me, I talked to so many people and there was one guy I was talking to and he was just, he had no idea what he was talking about as far as running a business had never done. I said, I said, sir, all respect. You need to go back to work for somebody. You do, you have no business trying to run a business and you're <laughs> you certainly not to spend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I said, you're certainly not going to run mine. So, you know, <laughs> I pissed him off, but I don't care. <laughs> um, Cause to me, it was about finding that right fit with the right sure. company. You know, in fact, I even did this little clandestine thing where I, I had the company, we took them all out to dinner one night at this local pub. And uh, the new guys that I was in conversations with, they kind of wanted to meet some of the guys. So he had a couple of his and they arranged to kind of accidentally bump into me there. And so then I had them join us at our table. And mm -hmm. so then the new sad. owners got to meet a lot of the guys and talk to them. Right. So, and no one knew, I mean, it, there, <laughs> nobody knew that this was going on. And that's, that's a key thing. When you are planning to sell, you cannot let any employee know what's going on. It's very see. lonely to do it that way. But unfortunately, if you do that, people get nervous, they'll leave. And then all of a sudden, the value of your business can go down. So, right. Yeah. So that exit is a very personal thing, how you accomplish it. Um, and when you are ready to make that step, again, make sure you have a good accountant, a good lawyer, and ones, and they may be different from the ones you have now because Buying and selling a business is a lot different than normal day-to-day -day running a business. So you need specialized people for that. So. Got it. Is, is the company still running? Is it, is it the new owners? <clears throat> so, going? no. What happened was uh, the guys that bought us were fantastic. And everybody loved it. Uh, he gave everybody a raise immediately. So it was a great nice. company. But then two years after that, he actually sold to a bigger company. Um, most of my guys were older like myself and they were ready to retire. So a lot of them just retired. Uh, mm -hmm. but there's a few guys still left even at the new company. So, oh, that's, you know, okay. Yeah. That's, so it, it must it, be kind it, of nice I, to kind of look over and see if the thing you started is still viable. It's still right. has your thumbprints on it, you know? <laughs> yeah, but not this case, but, uh, you know, a lot of my old clients still contact me and every now and then I'll do a little project for them. Uh, just got done doing one recently. It was kind of fun. So. You know, I still love doing projects and, and coding. So whenever somebody comes up and says, hey, Paul, can you uh, do this little project for me? I say, hey, no problem. I'd love to. So, yeah. We're just about at time. I just want to ask you, uh, what kind of questions should I be asking myself if I'm thinking about starting a business? Like what kind of person do I need to be? What kind of skills do I need to have? Um, yeah. And, you know, I have a more comprehensive list, list in that uh, YouTube video that I have up, up there. But you know, you got to really ask yourself, are you willing to dedicate the time and time? It is a time suck. So you, you really have to make sure you have the time you have buy-in from any, you know, interest parties, your spouse, um, that you do have a little bit of business knowledge. You know, you got to be really good at what you do as well. 
And I would highly recommend that you are very outgoing, you know, that you can get out there and speak and talk to people. If those, I think, are the core factors you have to have if you really want to get into business for yourself. Excellent. Where are you speaking next, Paul? Um, actually, I don't have anything right now. Actually, VS Live, we got a training, a two-day hands-on training. It's live over the web uh, coming okay. up March 19th, I believe, on .NET MAUI. So that's going to uh, be a lot Will you be at VS Live in Chicago? I will not. Um, I'm okay. not doing too many. I know. I don't go to too many conferences anymore. Um, we're so busy traveling the country in our RV that uh, <laughs> I, I find it hard to fit in things. So I do mostly things remote these days. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope to see yeah. you in your RV sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. That'd be great. So well, thank right. you so much, David. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. you. This has been show. great. I, I've, I've learned a few things today myself. Well, great. <laughs>